Well, I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Asa Dockery, the Senior Pastor of War Harvest North, and you are watching Keys to Kingdom Living. This week we're bringing you the second part, the conclusion to No One Will Know. And there's so much information on this, I'll not keep you, but get out your word, the Bible, and let's go into it together, and let's hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Now, unfortunately, we're seeing with our own eyes as this nation, which has been called for generation a Christian nation, is turning into a secular and humanistic society. Why is this happening? People will follow their heart. Wherever your heart is, there's where your, tre where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your treasure is on earth, your heart's going to follow that. If your treasure is in heaven, you'll do things to get you there, right? Turn with me to Matthew 15. Is this making you feel uncomfortable? If it is, I'm doing my job. Matthew 15, verse 4. For God commanded, yea, he suggested, he implied, he inferred. No, it says he commanded, saying, honor your father and mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. God said that. But you say, whoever says to his mother or father, whatever profit you might have received from me, it is a gift to God then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Political correctness was, used to be called tradition. It just got a new turn because tradition got old. It got found out. When the truth about a lie gets found out and exposes that lie, the lie has to metamorphose into something else. And it becomes something else new. But really it's the old thing with a new name. Hypocrites! No wonder they killed him. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, These people draw near, watch this, draw near to me with their mouth, but honor me with their lips, and their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Whew. Jesus is addressing here the condition of the hearts of the Jews that were listening. The Jews didn't want to obey the truth, nor did they want to honor God in their worship of Him. They wanted to appear religious, but not to the point of actually honoring God in their hearts. What kind of people would go through all of that facade? I mean, think about this. You get up. I mean, it, it's your day off. You get up early. You take a bath. You got to shave. You got to smell good. You got to put on something nice. And you go all the way to church and you sit in a boring service for an hour and then you say, why do you do all that? I want to look religious. I want to impress people. I want a, a girl in the church to think I'm saved. <laughs> Honoring God is far from your heart. Here's the danger and the warning for believers that want to have fire insurance, but refuse to honor God and His Word in their everyday life. Eventually, Christian, you will begin to lose spiritual sight because the Word is a lamp unto our feet, a path, and a light unto, uh, light unto our feet, and a, a lamp unto our path. And as Paul said in Romans 1, you will begin to believe a lie and fall back into sin, not even realizing it because you won't uh, have a consciousness of God. Now watch this. The more you dishonor God as a Christian, the more of his consciousness you will lose. As you lose God consciousness, you will live in sin and not realize it as sin. I did it, no one saw it, and I'm getting away with it. I did it again, no one saw it, so I'm getting away with it. What that does is it makes it easier to do it again the next time. Till eventually... Decisions become habits, habits become lifestyles, and lifestyles will put you in bondage to it. Paul says all things are permissible, but not all things are expedient. I will not be brought bond into bondage to anything, though I have the liberty to do all things. Now, remember what we read there in 1 Samuel 2.30 about Eli? For them that honor me, God says... 
I will honor them. And for those who despise me, I will lightly esteem. There is a trap of the enemy that believers, yes, believers, fall into when they decide to dishonor God in their hearts and desire to please self. It's called self-deception. Turn with me to Genesis 3.9. Let's find the root. Up to this point, point we've been pretty vague, but now God's going to hone in on you. He's going to find your nest, in other words. Say, oh boy. Genesis 3, 9. Now, Satan has come and tempted Eve to partake of uh, the forbidden fruit, but he does this through dishonor. He, he called God a liar. And Eve, when she chose to honor Satan's lie, she also chose to dishonor God, losing God consciousness. Are you with me? What happens in Romans 1 when you lose God consciousness? You, get, you believe a lie. So now they've, they've eaten it. And, and what's so good about this sin? I'm saying that very loosely. Is there's nobody around. It's just them. There's no press. There's no media to record whether or not you were there. So you could tell them anything and they would believe it because you're the only man and you're the only woman. There is no record. God is off golfing somewhere. He's not there. He is not there physically, is he? No. He left them there to make a decision. So there is nobody there. There's no closed circuit television watching them. Right? It's just them. So they can sin and nobody will know it. Wait, I think that's the title of the message. No one will know. Read verse uh, 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Like God didn't know. God's got GPS. It's called God Positioning Satellite. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. And he said, God said, Who told you, Adam, you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should eat? Then the man said, It was the woman. It was you and, and the woman. Youngs did it. Adam and Eve thought they would get away with their sin and no one would know what they had done because they used fig leaves to try and cover their sin. Now, even though God wasn't uh, there physically with them when they sinned, and even though neither of them confessed their sin, God still found out the truth about their sin. Are you with me? So you're there in your bedroom along with your computer, along with your paraphernalia, along with whatever it is you're along with, and you think, because nobody sees me and nobody knows me, nobody's going to find this out. The sign that you have fallen into the trap or the pit of Satan, again, as a Christian, is made known the moment you commit sin and sincerely believe in your heart that you will get away with it because no one saw you or knows what you did. That is a pit of the enemy. It is. Now, here's how you get into a pit. This is so good. God is just unloading on y'all today. When you get into your bedroom and your private space and nobody else is around, you feel the liberty to sin. That is Satan deceiving you. You have liberty, but God says, no, it's not. It's a pit. But it feels like liberty. I'm free finally to do what I want. I can gratify me, but what you're doing is dishonoring God. Right? Moving right along. God wasn't there with them when they sinned. But he still knew what they did, and they still had to face the consequences of their sin. Isn't that something? Now, in a court of law, your accuser and the prosecutory lawyer has to have evidence, proof that they saw it or they have to have evidence that it was done before they can convict, right? Or a jury will throw it out. Are you with me? God wasn't there. No one else was there. But yet, God still found out, and he still gave them the consequences of their sin. 
They believed they could dishonor God without God knowing it and get away, get away with it. But God got the final word, and they and their sins were exposed by God. Woo! How did God do that? How is it that he can be plumb over there in the Middle East fighting a war for Israel, and I'm over here in my bedroom in my own house with all the shades pulled, doing my thing, and then somebody finds out. How does that happen? God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing, and he's all-powerful. He's everywhere. Oh, shucks. Why didn't you tell me that before I sinned? You knew that, but you lost God consciousness because self makes it all about you, and you forget about those who are around you. Now, y'all okay? There is a principle, and it's been proven on video, that criminals are dumb. Now, there's some that are sharp, and they get away. Some of them with murder. But there are some that, that do things, and they're dumb because they don't think about stuff. This principle, listen to me if you're a criminal. <laughs> this principle will teach you how to be wise in the ways of the world. You take what I'm teaching to be truth and how to be wise in the ways of God, and you can pervert it so that you can prevent yourself from being incarcerated. All right, I'll honor God while I'm committing crime. And then God will teach me how I can use this wisdom to keep myself out of jail. No, it don't work that way. Because the moment you set your heart to dishonor God in order to commit a sin or a crime, you're bringing yourself into deception. And deception blinds you. And when you are blinded, you don't realize your surroundings. And it will be your sin that will find you out. Their sin. Adam didn't have to confess his sin. His sin found him out. Well, I was naked and I hid myself. Who told you you were naked? Adam just told on himself without confessing his sin. Isn't that something? How you can tell on yourself and get yourself in trouble without confessing your sin and coming clean of it? That's what sin does. It deceives you, and it throws you into a prison and into a dungeon, and you say, how did I get myself in? I never told anybody, but your sin told on you. Right? Now, the Bible tells us that the ways of a transgressor are what? Why? And because of the deceitfulness of sin, a transgressor will view the consequences of sin as injustice. Let me say that again. The ways of a transgressor are hard, and because of the deceitfulness of sin, when a person transgresses, they're in sin, right? The deceitfulness of sin will blind them, the hardness of the heart. And because of this, a, a, a transgressor who has not confessed their sins, he or her sin, will view the consequences of sin as injustice. And when a sinner, when a person, a Christian or a sinner, is in wrong been caught doing wrong, then they do not want justice for themselves. But when they are in the wrong and somebody does them wrong, they will demand immediate justice for themselves. Have you noticed this? This, this is very prevalent. I have seen this spirit dominate this region with people. People who are not right with God, who say they're Christians but dishonor God in their hearts, they will get into trouble, and when they get into trouble, they demand that, that mercy be served. But yet, if somebody does them wrong, they will demand immediate and swift justice on the person who have wronged them. Am I not, am I not preaching right? They, they will. When they, when they sin and they don't realize what they have done because of the deceitfulness of sin, the blindness of sin, and, and it caused them to have consequences of their sin, they will not connect their sin with the consequences. Just hang on with me, we're going somewhere. They will not connect their sin with the consequences of sin because sin has blinded them. And they cannot see 
the consequences as the results of their sinful behavior. This is so powerful. Isn't that awful? To be so bound up in sin, so blinded by sin, that you're sinning now and you have no consciousness of it. And then you walk out in life a few days, a few weeks, a few months later, you're enjoying your life in your own little world and you start running into these consequences, but because you're so blind, you don't realize these consequences are punishments for your sins back there. Whatever a man sows, that shall they also reap. You will reap in due season. And people do not make that connection. People are not making the connection. Listen to me. In America, that we are harvesting on the sins that we have sown in the past in this generation. We are harvesting the sin. And people are running the media mad with the problems of society. And they will not attribute it to the sins of our fathers. It's anything but sin. Right? Now... If you're sitting here as a Christian or there as a Christian with sin hidden in your heart and believe as Adam and Eve that it hurts no one because they don't know it, remember this. Hidden sin will be judged. And you will face the consequences of your sin, but by then you will have sinned away your day of grace. God gave Adam, ample opportunity to confess his sins. What have you done, Adam? That was his day of grace. That was his season, his moment in time to get it right with God. His sin was telling on him, but his mouth was not confessing it. God, I I did wrong. I sinned against you. I'm sorry. And he sinned away his day of grace, that moment of time between you commit sin and you either repent of sin or you pay for your sin. But if you'll repent of your sin, then God can forgive you and you won't have the, the, to suffer the severity of that sin. In conclusion, turn with me to 2 Samuel. My sin's not hurting anyone. Oh, really? This is why, this is why God set up kingdom authority. Kingdom authority looks like this. Kings, priests, pastors, employers, civil leaders, teachers, principals, parents. What do all these have in common? They all have one thing in common. They hold people personally responsible. What has happened in America we have stopped holding people personally responsible. I like what one, by, one person said the other night. Used to, the parents controlled the morality of the children. Now the children are controlling the morality of the parents. It has become subverted and perverted, and now it is wrong. A personal accountability and, and authority holding people to their uh, post and making them do what they should do is gone. All those uh, def- walls of defense have been destroyed because we have cast off restraint, as Proverbs 18 says. Without a vision, the people cast off restraint. We've lost our vision. We've lost our way as a nation. Amen? Hidden sin will still be judged, and you will still have to face the consequences, but by then you will have sinned away your day of grace. But if you'll repent, God can forgive you. Now look there in 2 Samuel 12. We wrap this up. Does this help you today? Then the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet of God, to David. Now, Nathan is David's biological son. And he came to him, his dad, and said to him, There were two men in one city. One, uh, one was rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd. A traveler came to the rich man. Let me bring that up to snuff. 
a demon came to David who refused to take of his own flock, his own wives, and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took uh, the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David, now look at David's response to somebody else's sin. Don't you love this? David was angry, and he was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely what? It's fun to pass judgment on other people. It's not so fun when they're passing it on you. Be careful of that little beam in your eye while you're picking out the splinter in somebody else's. Surely he will die. He shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no what? Pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. And that's not a good thing. You're the man. Fist bump. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over house and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. And I did all this and it wasn't enough because you did what you did. Notice that David is blind to his own sin here. Isn't that something? He's, he's committed adultery, had a baby out of wedlock, and now he's killed Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, the Hittite, and it, nobody knew it. It was his little secret, he and Bathsheba. Nobody will find this out. We got it covered. And he believed it in his heart that he had gotten away with it. Christians are sitting in churches right now thinking they got away with it. That is until the prophet shows up. I like Ahab. Not. King Ahab looks at Elijah coming in and says, Oh, the one who troubles Egypt, Israel. The prophet isn't the one who's, who troubles Israel. The prophet is the one sent of God to save Israel. Then the prophet Nathan shows up. As Nathan tells David this story about a man, it was a test. David failed this test miserably. Notice that this story backs up what I stated earlier concerning Christians who choose to dishonor God. He demanded, David demanded swift and decisive just, justice, that is until Nathan told him that he was the man. See how people, when our hearts are not right as Christians, we are very legalistic. What is going on in society right now? Legalism. Judgmentalism. No pity and no compassion on other people because our hearts are not right. The more your heart is right, like, I don't know, Jesus and John 8, they brought out a woman in the act of adultery. And those men who knew the woman's address, knew her habits, and knew what she was doing, those men wanted her stone. But Jesus, Jesus' heart was right. What did he say? You who without sin cast the first stone. Did he cast the stone, Jesus? No, he didn't. Why is it that people whose hearts are right are more compassionate with people whose hearts are wrong? And people whose hearts are wrong are less compassionate for those who are wrong. We shoot our own because we have evil in our own hearts. If we clean up our house first, then we'll have compassion to help someone else clean up their house. And we won't fall under condemnation. Give God praise there. Verse 9, God asked David, Why have you despised, there it is, did not honor the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never, ugh, ugh, never depart your house because you have despised me. If you honor me, I will honor you. But I did this in secret, and nobody knew it. It got found out anyway. Be sure your sin will find you out. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite, the little lamb, to be your wife, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversary against you, adversity against you, from your own house. 
And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie uh, with your wives in the sight of this son. Woo, that's fast judgment, isn't it? For you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun goes down. So David said to Nathan, here it comes. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. God had mercy on him or he would have died because he said to the man that did this evil thing, they will surely die. He pronounced his own judgment on himself. But God had mercy because he repented. But the problem is he repented after he was caught. There was swift judgment. Now, if you're here today and you have unconfessed, unrepented, and hidden sin in your heart, do you really want to run the risk as Adam and David? Their sins were printed Adam's and David's sins were printed in the most popular book of all time for everyone to read. Talk about busted. You have a choice to make today. Will you honor God in your heart or will you harden your heart yet again to God? The fact that the Lord has had me preach this word to you today tells me that your day of grace may be coming to a swift end. Well, we're out of time today, but I want to thank you for uh, watching the conclusion of this message. No one will know. Isn't it amazing how the revelation of the Holy Spirit gives us the ability from the Word of God to understand the ways of God, to understand the ways of Satan, and to understand sometimes as a human why our hearts are the way they are. I just appreciate and love God for the way that He unravels things and reveals them and gives them to us clearly. That's why Christ came, to reveal to us the mysteries of God and to destroy the works of the devil. And he has done that on your behalf and on mine. And so as I get ready to leave you, I want to ask you to uh, sit down, write us an email, let us know where you're watching from and how this ministry is helping you in your walk of faith. That's why God has raised this voice up to encourage his people in the faith. He has told us from the conception of this ministry that we are raised up to adorn the bride through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that means discipleship. So thank you for watching. If you have any prayer requests, please send those to us via, via email at prayer at WHC North. So until next time, may God richly bless and keep you as my prayer. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512.